Richard Baxter said a long time ago, and I'm going to echo his words, because this is perhaps one of the most difficult passages to preach to, to people. So I will preach as a dying man to dying men. And I will preach not my own word, but I will preach the word of God. And I will preach not out of a hardness or criticism or in any way seeking to harm or hurt, but I will preach my heart seeking to bless. I know that this is true and it therefore is our only hope. We have been in a series of Romans and we've spent a great deal of time in chapter 2 and then beginning chapter 3 and I would say again from chapter 1 verse 18 to chapter 320 which is where we come today that of all the whole section this is the most important. This is really the end of the trial and this is the time where the great apostle Paul comes as a master attorney and clinches the case putting forward the greatest evidence of all. There will be, by the end, no answer, no excuse. Let me warn you, these are perhaps the most devastating words in the whole of Scripture, devastating against the esteem of man. If anyone desires to protect self-righteousness, now is the time to leave. Remember, as you hear devastating words, oh, my heart breaks. These are not intended to harm, but only intended to bless, not curse. The whole passage, chapter 1, verse 18 to 320, Paul is angling at one major question. He wants to answer this question, and the question is, why do I need a righteousness from God? This section, this concluding portion, clinches with sweeping and profound evidence. The verdict, or his charge, excuse me, the charge is simple, that all people everywhere without excuse are really and radically corrupt and culpable. And so now this last message takes on the namesake of the series. A series that has repeatedly reminded us and exhorted us and have challenged us to know that humanity, every human being, is corrupt and culpable. And let me just warn everyone in the room. Our culture is on a collision course with this passage. It's going headlong in exactly the opposite direction. And it preaches to you Therefore, an opposite message. Let me just give you some examples, and maybe perhaps in some very quick way, since I know I'm half of the sermon done with my time, I normally have a lot more time, so um, very quickly, just remind us of where this comes from. It, certainly, they're found back in the Stoics with Hierocles, who taught about man being innately good, and, and that went nowhere because... Evidence was against it. And, but then after the Reformation, there was a calming and uh, there was this profound flowering blessing of the Reformation. And, and so there was a man by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a Swiss, uh, a Swiss philosopher and thinker of enlightenment, who basically said, you know what? We've, we've got it all wrong. In fact, all of human history got it all wrong. I got it all right. And here's what I got right. Man is good. Man is innately good. In fact, the only problem with man is he's born weak and he learns vice. So here's the deal. We just need to educate man and we need to give him good influence. And the world will be a happy place. Rousseau had a profound impact. In fact, one of his greatest influences on his social contract writing was that he articulated that this is the real problem in humanity and therefore, if we just address this with education and influence, uh, well, we can create an ideal society. No small wonder that he was the number one influencer of the French revolutionists. No small wonder that he was the number one influencer of Karl Marx. No wonder 
that Immanuel Kant took his ideas and tried to marry them to Christianity. No small wonder that the whole, the whole arena of popular psychology now sings this song. Seen in Health has a headline. Breaking news alert. People are inherently good. I'm not joking. And it goes on to try to talk about how we're inherently good. Because it gives us example that if, if, you're, if you're in an office and a baby in a waiting room, let's say, and a baby's on a chair and starts to fall, anybody would help it. There's evidence. There's proof. We're all good. Are you kidding me? How about that's an echo of the image of God in you? How about the reality that every human being is made by God for God's glory and to enjoy him? That every human being is wired for good, a good that centers on God. And yeah, we, we, we will do some good things, but those good things are always corrupted by our motives, by our ambitions, for self-preservation or self-advancement. Self. Breaking news alert, eh? Hmm. Well, listen to how one of the paragraphs in the article reads. Some people are evil though, right? It's probably in the question because it wants to undermine it. Well, putting aside religious arguments on the existence of evil, the article says, when we brand people with that label, we lose the opportunity to address the causes of their actions. <gasps> I don't know if I could craft a more opposite reality. When you tell people they're good is when you lose the opportunity to address the cause of their bad. We heard the gospel over and over and over in the waters of baptism. And here's the deal. Some in this room don't believe it. And you know why? Because you don't believe this passage. Because you believe Rousseau. You believe that we're good. I'm not as bad as Hitler after all. Always comparing. Well, that's why Luke Bryan hit the charts with a country music song, Most People Are Good. Lyric goes like this, I believe most people are good. I believe you love who you love. Ain't nothing you should ever be ashamed of. I believe this world ain't half as bad as it looks. I believe most people are good. I believe that youth is spent well on the young because wisdom in your teens would be a lot less fun. Hmm. I believe if you just go by the nightly news, your faith in all mankind would be the first thing you lose. Maybe we should look at reality and not have faith in fairy tales that were good. Shouldn't evidence be like <laughs> fact? Shouldn't evidence be what we see in reality rather than just singing songs to sway us in our thinking? So Yale University hosted this, what was called a brilliant experiment, where they took an infant and they had shapes. They didn't want to skew the experiment because they didn't want to put people figures that the babies would be drawn to. So they just used shapes. And what they did is they, these puppet shapes, and they had these shapes. One shape was trying to claim a mountain. And these other shapes, the helper shapes, came along and helped them. And then another, another time, he, this one tried to climb a mountain, and then, then this hinder shape came in and started pushing him down. So these little colors and shapes, and then they did this. They watched the baby and analyzed his attention when the climber, when they put the helper shapes and the hinder shapes, and they put the climber in the middle and showed the climber going to one of them. And they said, look, the human is more interested in good. And there's our proof positive. And the whole pop psychology community just was up in arms. There we go. We got our evidence. We're good. Have you ever thought that maybe God designed the human being, even from its infancy, to shun evil? 
Have you ever thought that maybe that is a testimony to the exact truth that the Bible teaches, that you were made for God, you were made for good, but here's the problem, you're culpable because you don't choose it. Another article says nine reasons why humans are inherently good, and it says this, sometimes we all need a good reminder that no matter what is going on in the world around us, humans are inherently good. According to these science-backed facts, oh, I love statements like that. I was a scientist, that's baloney. That's not empirical science. Human observation of behavior, drawing conclusions based upon your philosophy. It's built upon presuppositions. It's not built upon empirical evidence. So, What's going on in our world around us? Humans are inherently good. According to these science-based facts, our species is pretty great. Whenever you need an extra dose of positivity, read these facts that will put things into perspective. And it gives you nine reasons why humanity is good. Number one, we naturally help other people. Number two, rewards have nothing to do with it. Number three, we crave authentic friendships. Number four, we're also meant to fall in love. Number five, we genuinely value honesty. Number six, Humanity loves to hug. Number seven, smiling is a basic human instinct. (laughs) Number eight, humans are extremely resilient. And number nine, we're naturally giving. This is your evidence. Hmm. Well, Psychology Today just wrote an article. Headline is, people are naturally good, but groups are not. Hmm. There's the problem. We're actually good, but when we get in a group, we're not good. (laughs) Grouping is the problem. And so psychologist Steven Pinker says this, and I quote, something in modernity and its cultural institutions has made us nobler. That's Rousseau. Listen to what he says next. On the scale of decades, comprehensive data again paint a shockingly happy picture. Making claim about evidence again, are you? Well, I have a little bit of evidence. Let me read some of this evidence to you, just a little bit. World War I, 1914, 15 million people slaughtered. Russia, Civil War, 1922, 9 million people slaughtered. Soviet Union, under Stalin's regime, 1924, 20 million people slaughtered. World War II, 1937, 55 million people slaughtered. 1949, the Chinese Civil War, 2.5 million people slaughtered. People's Republic of China, under Mao Zedong in 1975, 40 million people slaughtered. The Congo Free State, which started in 1908, 8 million people slaughtered. China, Nationalist Party, 1937, 3.1 million people slaughtered. North Korea War in 1948, 2 million people slaughtered. The Korean War that resulted in 1953, 2.8 million people slaughtered. Rwanda and Burundi, 1959, 1.35 million people slaughtered. The Second Indochina War in 1960, 3.5 million people slaughtered. Nigeria, 1966, 1 million people slaughtered. Bangladesh, 1971, 1.25 million people slaughtered. 1975, Cambodia, you only have 1.65 million people slaughtered. Mozambique, 1975, you've got 1 million. Afghanistan, 1979, 1.8 million. In Sudan, 1983, 1.9 million. And Congo, in Kinshasa, you have 1998. In 1998, 3.8 million people slaughtered. And I can read to you on and on and on. And not one of those was outside of the 20th century. Not one of those was in the name of religion. Every one of those was through an atheistic, Darwinistic, Karl Marx-type mentality of peace. But we're good. Do you know that more people were slaughtered in an atheistic worldview in the 20th century than all previous 20 centuries added together? So much for the, so much for the holy war is our real problem. Sounds more like atheistic worldview is our real problem. It sounds more like when you understand who you are, there's hope. And when you fool yourself and deceive yourself into thinking you're something you're not, only destruction. Millions and millions and millions. This is why Karl Barth in World War II would say this, 
The whole course of human history pronounces the indictment against itself. And then he goes on, listen carefully to the words of this theologian. No serious thinker holds that people are good. Amen to that. Listen, it's not that we do sin. It's that we are sinners through and through. It is who we are by nature. It's not simply a choice we make. Sin has more to do, more to do with God than with people. Sin is intrinsically relative to God. In other words, sin has no ultimate meaning apart from God. Which means, when you're godless, you can think we're good. Because you don't know the weight of sin. Well, let me say it this way. All of the horrible atrocities committed between human beings are all symptoms, not causes. All of those millions of lives, precious lives that will live forever, slaughtered. Uh, That's all symptom, not cause. In fact, I'll give you the evidence. At the moment that sin entered this world, the very first thing we see is murder between two brothers. Therefore, when righteousness, a right relationship with God is broken, you will only have brokenness between people. There is a necessary relationship between the vertical and the horizontal. Every evil perpetrated from creature to creature is the symptom of evil perpetrated from creature to God. So apart from understanding this, there is no hope of true peace in this world, no hope of true goodness among men. Well, the context of Romans 3, and this passage in particular, it's striking to me. When people want to say we're good, that's a person who thinks they're righteous in themselves. They don't need a righteousness from God. And isn't it striking that that's exactly where this passage ends up, addressing the foremost people in the ancient world who thought they had a right relationship with God, who were self-righteous, when in fact, when in fact, they needed a righteousness from God. The hardest people to reach with the good news of Christ are people who think they're good. People who think they're not so bad. People who are self-righteous. I mean, that's Romans 10, 3, right? Ignorant of the righteousness of God, they were seeking to establish their own. That's who Paul's talking to. What we find here is that final indictment of being corrupt and culpable. Let me explain what I mean by corrupt. Corrupt is something really a powerful way to think about this because what it does is it contrasts the present from the previous. Think about it. Corrupt implies the change of something once good. I dare say this, please mark this in your hearts, that a true biblical anthropology, a true understanding of man with the depth of the corruption understood is actually the highest view of man in the whole world. Sounds kind of contrary, doesn't it? A little counterintuitive. Let me explain. It's because only only when we see what's happening here, only when we understand that we were made for so much more, only when we go beyond this normalization of evil, only when we realize, no, it's not okay that I say this to my wife or my husband. No, it's not okay that I think this or I do this. Only when I stop comparing myself to other sinners and begin to see God and the glory of his goodness, only then will I see what I was made for. Humanity is glorious and beautiful, but broken. So we don't disparage humanity. We don't look down on humanity. We are made in the image of a holy and good and righteous God. We of all people must know the dignity of humanity. 
We must uphold that man is so much more valuable than he begins to understand. He's settling for mud, thinking that's good. He needs to see he's made for so much more. And he can only, only find it in Christ. So, when I say corrupt, I mean the tragic breaking of the heart reality that once what was once good is now corrupted. Corruption is not original. The, original, the origin of man was not corrupt. It, respond, it corresponds to that which is corroded, which is polluted, that was good. So here's the thesis. All people everywhere, without exception, are really and radically corrupt and culpable. And the purpose of this message is not to promote despair, but to promote despair of self-righteousness and to promote the crying out for Christ. And what we're going to see is three basic categories of evidence that he's going to, or two categories of evidence and then one, one final clinching argument. And the two categories of evidence are going to move in this way. That every person is corrupt and he's going to move to every part of a person is corrupt and then he's going to finalize it with every person is culpable. He goes from the wideness of corruption to the depth of corruption to the liability of corruption. Let's look at them one at a time. Number one, and I'll move a little bit, oh, sorry, thank you, uh, quickly here. So please just follow with me as you are able. Number one, every person is corrupt. And we find this right here in this text, verse nine and following. The whole point is it's all inclusive. It's universal. 14 times, you mark this down, 14 times, Paul emphasizes universality. Let me just walk you through them. You'll notice them. In the Greek, it's a little bit stronger, but you can still see it in the English. Watch this. In verse 9, no, not at all. When he asks if the Jews are better, first thing he wants to say is no. It's a universal problem. So number one, no, not at all. Number two, we have already charged that all, all. Number three, Jews and Gentiles. Every statement so far, three times, it's universal. Let's go on. No, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they are, have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. And now drop down to 19. We know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. So that here we are, no, number 12. Every mouth may be stopped. And number 13. And the whole world may be held accountable. And lastly, Verse 20, for by the works of the law, no human being. This is a devastating, sweeping indictment on the evidence that everyone, everyone is corrupt. Every human being. And he doesn't just leave it with, let me just tell you, everyone. He does the positive and he does the negative. You know, the negative, like no one, no, not one. The positive, like all, everyone. There's no, there's no more solid way to make the case. So when he says no, not one, he, he means there is not a single exception to this. This isn't hyperbola. This is revelation from your maker to explain you, listen, just listen to these quickly. First King, Kings 8, 46. If they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin. Psalm 143, 2. Enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. Ecclesiastes seven twenty. Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Psalm 130, verse 3, if you, O Lord, should count iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? This is not Pauline theology. This is biblical theology. 
From the beginning, God has revealed. And the Old Testament knew it well. You know, this really is Paul's final argument against the Jew. You notice how he starts in verse 9. What then? Are we Jews any better off? (laughs) Privileges or no privileges? Before the bar of perfect justice, if you're a criminal, you're guilty. Doesn't matter what home you come from. Doesn't matter what blood's course in your veins. Doesn't matter what skin color you have. Doesn't matter how religious you are. You commit the crime before perfect justice, you're guilty. You're liable to judgment. That's his argument. That's the plain point. And when he turns into sight, Old Testament, this string of pearls, really, it's what the rabbis used to do, it's string a bunch of scriptures together, make this huge necklace. This necklace chokes us. <laughs> Put it around us and say, look, look at this. That's all he does. He quotes all these different places in the Old Testament. And my, I think it's fascinating because what is he doing? He's effectively showing, look, um, the indictment doesn't come from me or the Gentiles. Mr. Jew, the indictment comes from your own Bible. Look at verse 19. Isn't that why he says this? Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. In other words, I just quoted all this Old Testament reality, and it's talking to you. You who hold the Bible and say, I'm justified because I know these things. It's talking to you. That's what Paul is arguing. This isn't about the Gentiles. Most of these quotes talk about the Gentiles, but Paul is saying, no, it's actually relating to you too. That's why he would say this in 19, where so that every mouth may be stopped. You know which mouth was not stopped at this point? I think the Gentiles' mouth was stopped because they had no, they had no excuse. They're left without excuse. They have nothing to say. They're guilty. But it was the Jew. It was the, the self-righteous religionist person like we have today. They're the ones that have the mouth of self-justifying excuses. I'm good. I'm not that bad. Paul says, no, it's actually for you too. And what does he say about this? He says, uh, both Greeks, what we charge that all, both Jews and Greeks are under sin. Verse 9. And what does that mean, under sin? Well, it means that we're under a rule. It means that there is a dominion. It means more than just the fact that in the eyes of justice we're guilty. It means we're under a dominion. The issue here is that we are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. We sin because there's a dominion of sin over us, naturally, apart from Christ. This is why Galatians 3.22, but the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. You see what Paul says to the Galatians? He says, no, the, the scriptures have this purpose. They want to confine you under and show you and expose you to be seen imprisoned, enslaved under sin. That's why Ephesians talks about this, that we are dead in our trespasses and sins in which, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest of mankind. Martin Lloyd-Jones says it this way, the best man, the noblest, the most learned, the most philanthropic, the greatest idealist, the greatest thinker, say what you like. There has never been a man who can stand up to the test of the law. And isn't it striking? We hear all these words today as I quote to you, psychology, that we're good, on the anniversary of 9-11. And I ask you this question. Why is there terrorism? Because men are under sin. Why are there shootings in schools? Because men are under sin. 
Why is there rape? Because men are under sin. Why is there sex trafficking? Because men are under sin. Why is there tyranny? Why is there abortion? Why are there murders? Why are there tortures and persecutions? Why are there beatings and abductions and physical abuse and sexual abuse and verbal abuse? Why is there bullying? Why is there muggings? Why is there thievery? Why is there vandalism? Why is there lying? Why is there extortion? Why is there rioting? Why is there perversion? Why is there divorce? Why is there neglect? Why is there betrayal? Why is there strife? Why are there wars? Because men are under sin. Who are you going to believe? All people everywhere without exception are really and radically corrupt. Paul has made the case. It's everyone. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. And it brings us right to the second point. That every part of a person is corrupt. Not only is every person corrupt, but every part of a person is corrupt. This speaks of the pervasiveness. Not just the universality, but within a single person, it's pervasive. The point here is so, so profound. And really, what I want you to notice is this. Four little sub-points I want you to capture just to think about how this works. It moves from the core to the character to the conduct. And then finally, to what is considered. So let's just look at these sub-points. A would be the core in verse 10. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. I want you to just catch this. This is the core of the human being. When he talks like this, he's talking not about what he does, He's talking not about what he says. He's talking about who he is in his innermost person, the core. At the core, no one is righteous. At the core, no one is good. Here's the point. When he says no one understands, it got my attention. Let's just take this verse and let's just go back to Rousseau. Does Rousseau understand? Here's the fundamental problem with the world's theories. Our very minds are infected by our unrighteousness. Sin not only makes us guilty of transgression, it is not only in itself iniquity and evil, but sin alters us. It changes how you think. It changes what you can understand. No one understands, which means that every human being is infected, and this infection doesn't only infect our cravings, it infects our thinking. It doesn't only affect how I want to do things that are evil, but it affects that I can't even reason properly. We've done a great disservice trying to separate the brain from the heart. It's one inner person. You think with what you crave. You see, not only is our ability to want God crippled by our sin, but so is our ability to understand God. So is our ability to understand what is right and what is wrong. There are many people that we should weep over, even in the church, and certainly outside the doors of the church. Many people who don't understand, they actually think they're right. They see their own way as right. Every man sees his own way as right. Because they don't understand. Failing to understand God is our fault. Because it's the consequence of corruption, which is from sin. And sin blinds and corrupts our understanding of reality. It skews us. It's like taking a tape measure and you're going to try to build something. But the tape measure is all wrong. All the measurements are wrong. You'll never get it built right. Especially when the, when the marks keep changing, which is what our society does. It's like putting glasses on that have all kinds of skewed angles and you don't see. Everything's distorted in the world. How are you going to tell me what's accurate? 
How are you going to be precise about what's true and what's right? No, no one understands. And then it moves right here to no one seeks God. No one seeks God. You notice that the seeking follows the understanding? You know why? You don't seek what you don't understand. Nobody seeks something they don't understand. You have no craving for it. You don't want it. You're only going to seek what you understand and what you understand to be good and, and attractive. Oh, and let me mark this. Oh, please, listen carefully. The word is not search. Some think it's like search, you know, like no one searches for God. Let me just, news brief, God is not lost. Man is. Man doesn't search for God. God is not hiding. The issue is man is blind and doesn't see because he doesn't understand because he's corrupt. And so therefore, if he himself, I mean, every religion in the world tells you that man is some way good because he's seeking after God. Every religion will tell you that. Atheism will tell you that, whatever their God is, science. Every, every philosophy says, you're basically good and you're seeking after most people, most people. There are those exceptions which we can't explain, but most people are seeking good, God, ultimately. Here's the problem. Christianity is the only, the only faith in the entire history of humanity that says, uh-uh-uh. There's not a single man who seeks God. Instead, God seeks them. Jesus Christ said, I came to seek and to save the lost. And only, only in Christ does God come and seek sinners. Now, with that in mind, I want to explain what does this seek mean? Because if it's not search, trying to discover, find him, then what really does it mean? Oh, and this excites my soul greatly. It means, it's not passive ignorance, like I don't know. It's an act of rejection. To seek God in biblical terms is to desire him. To seek God in biblical terms is to long to be with him. To seek God is like this, Psalm 27, 4. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. One thing I ask for, to seek God. Or... Psalm 42, 1, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before you? I seek God. Psalm 63, 1, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water, that's my life apart from you. I seek God. No one seeks God on their own. No one seeks his will. No one anchors all their happiness and the fountain of their happiness in God. But those in Christ will. Those in Christ could say things like, you have said, seek my face and my heart says to you, O Lord, your face will I seek. Well, let me close this out. Oh, this is a hard thing. In verse 12, we have the character. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. They've turned aside. It's what they do from the core. And I want you to catch this. From the core, the depth of inside, it goes out from that circle and you see the character of the person. It goes out from that circle and you see the words of the person. And it goes out from that circle and you see the conduct of the person. And it goes out from that circle and you see what they consider with their eyes. I think that's a pretty strong illustration to say that the whole person is corrupt. Because next, when he says character, he's talking about here what we have done. We've turned aside. We don't seek God. We turn away from God. And when it says worthless, it means literally something that was good and useful and profitable. Often it was used in the ancient world for milk. Before refrigerators, they'd use this word to describe milk that had gone bad. 
It was good for nourishment at one time. But now it's bad and can harm you. And that's what humanity has become in character. And then the conduct is in verse 12 at the end. No one does good, not even one. No one. You notice it doesn't say no one's perfect. (laughs) Everyone will tell you that. It's not what it says. It says no one's good. (laughs) Hello. No one's good. So it's the character. And you might say, well, hang on now. You've just given me six negatives and nothing to relieve me. And you're telling me that there's just no goodness here. There's no goodness in humanity. And, 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 and you're saying, well, wait a second. I mean, listen, let me just make this clear because I'm out of time. <laughs> no one does as bad as they could, but no one does as good as they should. No one is as bad as they could be, but not one is righteous. No one expresses their depravity fully, but not one is righteous. No one is truly exercising evil to their own capacity. But all are liable. You know, when we see this, see things like this, we might say, well, this isn't fair because, you know, he's going to talk about murder and I don't murder. I'm better than that. If that's the way you're thinking, you've missed the entire point and there's no hope. Here's here's the way we must think. We must come to understand. We must see that for an act to be righteous before a holy God, its aim, its ambition, and its action must be right. If you just do the right action, but inside you're hating God, it's not righteous. If your mom tells you, sit down, Johnny, and Johnny says, no, his action's wrong. But if her mom, his mom says, Johnny, sit down right now. And then Johnny sits down. His action's right. But then he looks and says, I might be sitting down on the outside, but on the inside, I'm standing up. <laughs> Johnny's wrong. And that's every one of us, naturally. Not one of us is righteous, not one. And thoroughly, this is true. And notice how then he moves to the instruments of the heart because he talks about the heart and from the abundance of the heart, the what? The mouth speaks. And he moves from the, from the core to the character and now he's gonna give us this profound picture. What is it? Verse 13, their throat is an open grave. You know what it is? Here we go. It's a channel. It's like a tunnel, like the hobbit, like a tunnel that goes down and it's a grave, a stenching dead bodies inside and it's just totally open. The dead body stench is the core, the heart. And the, the, the throat is the channel to the heart. And it goes from the throat to the tongue, to the lips, to the mouth. And he's effectively saying, radiating from the inside of the human being is depravity. It's profound imagery. And let me just make this one quick observation. There hasn't been a single divorce without the mouth. There hasn't been a single war without the mouth. The mouth is a deadly weapon. So, verse 15, their feet are swift to shed blood. And again, we like to justify ourselves, but I would just say, you know, one time I, we were getting a hotel, a fly, you know, park and fly. Profound story. Happened right here in San Francisco. And my uncle and my father are there and trying to, you know, park their truck. And the guy had this crazy setup. And so they're like, look, we're not going to park. We want a refund. We're going somewhere else. And the guy says, no, I'm not going to give you a refund. I said, what? No, no, you're going to give us a refund. We're going to go somewhere. No, you're, I'm not going to give you a refund. So some things happened on both sides that weren't good. And elevation of volume and the whole bit. Pretty soon they're yelling. Next thing I know, this man from India looks at my father, sticks his hand in his face and says, do you know I can have you killed for $20? Whoo. I can have you killed for $20. That's in the heart of every man. Don't look down on that man. That's everyone apart from Christ. Here's the deal. Man left to himself, he wants what he wants. And people are just obstacles. I'll get what I want. 
at your expense. That's how every man lives. Apart from constraint or a change from within. Well, the consideration is verse 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And that's all I, I just wanted to bring us to this. This, this worldview is the issue, isn't it? It's a worldview. Your fear of God determines everything else about you. If you do not fear God, you will not understand. You will not seek him. You will not, from the core to the character to the conduct, you will not do right. You can call it right, but God says even our righteousness will be filthy rags. Even the best we can do is all tainted because our ambitions are wrong. Our goals are wrong. Our actions on the outside might be okay. But everything on the inside is like dead men's bones. Well, that's the indictment because there's no fear of God before them. Let me close this, and I mean this very shortly with this. Every person is culpable. And this is how it ends. Culpable underscores accountability, liability, guilt that is liable before justice. Let me just read these two verses and close this. Now we know that, what, this is verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. What's the purpose of this whole this whole indictment, these two evidences, the evidence of truly every person and the evidence that every part of a person, the answer and liability is simply to silence those who justify themselves. Silence those who say, I'm just not that bad or I can't believe that that nice old lady down the street is liable to God's judgment or I can't believe children are liable to God's judgment. And what I say to that very plainly is simply this. Your worldview, your perspective, your thinking is based entirely on humanity and not on God. You have no understanding of what is holy and what is righteous. And therefore, there is no hope to cure the real cause of the problem. Only when we come to see the real cause, then is there hope. Let me say this. When it says that every mouth will be stopped, it means God knows every detail. Listen, you know why? You know why there's defense attorneys who will speak up in a court case? Because there's hope that maybe the judge might not know something that will change the verdict. Guess what? This judge knows everything. There's nothing that can be said by you or anyone else to change the verdict. And this word comes to you as grace so that you can know now. Don't wait. Because there's coming a day. You are not an accident. You were made for the glory of God. You were made to enjoy him. You were made for so much more than normalizing evil and calling it good. You were made for true goodness, for true righteousness, for true joy. So, God warns you ahead of time, if you are not in Christ, who suffered on the cross in your place. Isn't that exactly where this is going? The very next verse. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, apart from what you can do. And then verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Because he died to take your sentence. And to get that, God says, don't work for it. Nothing you could do is righteous. Just turn away from evil and trust in Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the grace you've shown us this day. The testimony of the gospel that is real and alive and truly transforms lives one at a time. Remind us and shape our thinking. I ask your blessing on each one. If there's a single heart here who does not know you truly, has not bowed the knee to confess their sin 
and to ask Christ to forgive them. I pray, Lord God, please move even now. And for all who are in Christ, how do we walk away? Oh God, please minister to our hearts. Destroy every ounce of pride in us. Remind us that not one of us is better than another human being. Remind us that except for Jesus Christ, we would be wicked people. And therefore, help us to, with joy and delight, know our purpose and live it out. To make much of Christ in every detail of life. Oh, God, please help us. We are so needy. For your glory and the joy of all, even in and through us, we pray. Amen.